Thank you very much to my committee colleagues. Uh, so uh, here is the notice of collections. Uh, sorry. And uh, personal information collected as a result of this public meeting hearing and on the forms provided at the back of the room is collected under the authority of the Planning Act and will be used to assist in making a decision on this matter. All names, addresses, opinions, and comments may be collected and may form part of the minutes which will be available to the public. Questions regarding the collection should be forwarded to the Director of Planning, Building, and Licensing Services. The purposes of public meetings is to present planning applications in a public forum as required by the Planning Act. Following pr presentations of the applicant, uh, committee members will be afforded an opportunity to ask questions for clarification or further information. The meeting will then be opened to the public for comments and questions. Interested persons are requested to give their name and address for recording in the minutes. There is also a sign-in sheet for interested members of the public at the back of the room. No decisions are made at public meetings concerning applications unless otherwise noted. The public meeting is held to gather public opinion. Exemption to this rule is outlined in bylaw 2006-75 to delegate various planning approvals to staff and to adopt certain procedures for the processing of planning applications. Subject to delegated authority, Council has authorized staff to use discretion in determining if an application can be a combined public meeting comprehensive report to expedite the approval process. Information gathered at public meetings is then referred back to planning, building, and licensing services staff for the preparation of a comprehensive report and recommendation to planning committee. This means that the meeting tonight, that after the meeting tonight, staff will be considering the comments made by the public in their further review of the applications. When this review is completed, a report will be prepared making a recommendation for action to this committee. The recommendation is typically to approve with conditions or to deny. This committee then makes a recommendation on the applications to City Council. City Council has the final say on the applications from the City's perspective. Following Council decisions, notice will be circulated in accordance with the Planning Act and anyone with an interest in the matter may file an appeal. Interested persons are advised that if a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appear or to appeal the decision of counsel to the Ontario Municipal Board unless, in the opinion of the board, there is reasonable grounds to do so. So we'll move along, and I apologize, I have two pieces of agenda here. The first public meeting that we'll hear today is a zoning bylaw amendment request, and it's file D14030-2017, 153 and 156 Brock Street. Uh, so we'll uh, call that uh, forward. Uh, I will introduce staff quickly. Uh, Derek Auger is our, uh, I did pronounce it right, yep. is our, uh, our clerk, a planning clerk. Uh, Marty Vendetti is uh, the manager in planning, and if you, you or other planners could introduce themselves, I won't embarrass myself by not knowing everybody. Lindsay Lambert. Andrea Furness. Golsa Karamagadam. And welcome to our new planners. Uh, so, 
uh, we're ready to begin. Great. Good evening, councillors, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Robert Mello. My partner and I, uh, my partner is Joe Ruffalo, and I have a long history of responsible property stewardship in the city of Kingston. Our intention regarding these two buildings is to return them to residential and sustainability. With Kingston experiencing its lowest vacancy rate in recent decades, this much needed change is a move in a positive direction. We look forward to properly maintain these buildings, recognizing their historic value to the community. Thank you for your consideration. I'm ready to answer any questions. Great, that was brief and to the point. Uh, are there any uh, comments from staff? Yeah, regarding the application? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Pursuant to the requirements of the Planning Act, a notice of statutory public meeting was provided by advertisement in the form of signs posted on the subject site 20 days in advance of the public meeting. In addition, notices were sent by, by mail to all 63 property owners within 120 meters of the subject property. To date, we have not received any correspondence with respect to this application. Thank you. Uh, any questions from committee members regarding this? Seeing none, I just had one, if the vice chair could take the chair. I take the chair Thank and I you. recognize you. Uh, very quickly, I, sorry, I, I meant to walk by those, I stand out in front there for the bus every day, and I was trying to visualize what's there now. Is, is it commercial space at this time or is it vacant? The, uh, <clears throat> it's been vacant for almost four years. And um, it was commercial on the ground floor, um, commercial on the second floor, and I, it was residence on the third floor for a period of time. I'm not sure how long. And uh, uh, so it's, uh, we're trying to get it back to residential, where, which is what it was before. Okay. And just a quick question for staff, if I could. Um, I know that the zoning encourages commercial ground floor in that area. Has there been any response from the BIA, any concerns that you're aware of expressed with the loss of commercial space in that corridor? Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, according to the requirements of the official plan, um, this area is does not uh, um, retail on the ground floor is not mandatory in this area. Um, so um, based on that um, and giving the, um, the surrounding uh, land uses, uh, there shouldn't, well, um, it seems to be an appropriate use on the ground floor. Thank you. I appreciate having professional planners because I had assumed that, that it was mandatory on that ground floor, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to add to that, um, the property, as indicated by the applicant, has been vacant for a significant period of time. Given that it's a listed property with respect to heritage, it's important that the property be occupied and ongoing maintenance occur on the property just to make sure, ensure that there's adaptive reuse of a structure of this nature. So there's a lot of supporting factors with respect to that. You know how to appeal to my heritage side. Thank you very much. Any, uh, oh. I'll give you back the chair. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, any questions or comments from the public? And public comments are restricted to five minutes. And if you could just identify yourself, uh, name and address. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for the report and the presentation. Uh, Frank Dixon, 495 Alfred, Department 2, K7K, 4J4. So I do walk by there regularly, and um, in principle, I'm supportive of the change. Um, we need more residential uh, accommodations in Kingston, so your plan to transform the properties back into that status is, I think, appropriate. Um, my main questions are uh, following on a little bit from what um, the manager of planning was talking about, and I spoke to her before about this. Um, just the report is maybe not quite as um, 
maybe clear and thorough as I would like to see. Um, it doesn't actually say that it's listed, although the planner did say that, and it's not designated as heritage, right? So I believe that it, it dates from so, somewhere in the 1830s, 1840s. That's my estimation. I'm looking at other properties that I know about on adjacent blocks. And it seems similar in architecture to buildings on Brock Street down between King and Wellington on the south side. Um, sort of classic Kingston limestone um, buildings. So let's just see more about that in the report. And the, I know you're not planning any changes to the property at this point. You just want to change the status. You're not changing the actual physical uh, characteristics of it. But um, I guess what I would, I would put in a word to have uh, an examination of heritage designation um, carried out and seeing uh, what we could do with that. I think it's a heritage asset that we could do more with. And um, I guess that's basically the end of, of my input. Um, all the best with uh, your plans. Thank you. I can give a little response to that if you want. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll just see if there's any other okay. uh, public questions and then we'll go to the... Okay, great. So any further questions, comments from the public? Seeing none, the floor is yours. Uh, our intention is to maintain uh, the exterior um, as as it is, and to make all the improvements to make sure that none of the wood is going to be breaking down any more than what it is. Um, you know, if there's any pointing that needs to be done, you know, it's just uh, uh, you know, it's a beautiful. Those are two beautiful buildings. We really uh, like them, and uh, we're you know we want to maintain the stone on the inside. There's a lot of beautiful stone and brick and stuff on the inside, so we want to maintain all of that. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll go back to the committee. Are there any questions, comments from the committee? Seeing none, uh, we'll look for a mover and a shaker. For Oh, I'm sorry, this is a public meeting only. I'm asleep at the switch. Uh, so we'll move on. I'll declare this public meeting closed and we'll move on to our second public meeting tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the second meeting is held pursuant to the Planning Act. It's an official plan and zoning bylaw amendment. And it's uh, for 1201 McAdoo's Lane. Uh, and uh, I see the representative is here. Uh, so take it away. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and congratulations on your appointment. Uh, my name is Mike Keene, and I'm a land use planner with Foten Consultants. And I'm here tonight to present to you an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment at 1201 McAdoo's Lane. And this is an application for a logistics terminal. So as, as many of you will know, McAdoo's Lane is located north of the highway uh, between the 401 and Burbrook Road, and it's bound by Division Street on its west, and um, I should say Division Perth Road, and on the east it's bound by Montreal Street, Battersea Road. And it's an area that has a long-standing history of uh, rural industrial uses, quarries, cement manufacturing, landfills, automotive repair. But besides that, it is also an area that has a number of sensitive land uses close by. Uh, our site is currently vacant. It is a 15-acre uh, parcel that's part of a broader 90-acre parcel of land, the far west side of the property highlighted in blue. Uh, close to one of the cement plants. Uh, but in addition to that, there are uh, residential uses. There are a couple of homes uh, on McAdoo's Lane by Victory Lane Auto. There is also the Kingston Family Fun World Park. And then there is a lane that comes off of McAdoo's Lane, uh, Italia Lane, which has the Italian Club, two homes, uh, there as well, and there are a few homes on the east side of McAdoo's Lane close to um, close to Battersea Road. 
McAdoo's Lane, uh, probably because of its history of a industrial area, is also an emergency detour route uh, as appointed by the 401. So it is certainly a road that sees a lot of truck traffic. In looking at the application that's before the committee tonight, uh, we're seeking an official plan amendment. The site has is partially designated as rural industrial and partially designated as rural. So we are seeking to make the entire 15-acre uh, property, not the 90-acre property, the 15 acres subject to this application, subject to a special rural policy. We are also seeking a zoning bylaw amendment for the parcel of land that would change it from the A1 zone to a rural industrial zone. And in the future, uh, should this application be successful, we would be seeking a site plan control application to control the actual development. I think some of my pictures are not showing up for some reason on here. Yeah. Like they're, I don't know. We were, yeah, we're having some problems with PowerPoint, but we'll try to get it back up. Maybe I should have left it out. <laughs> yeah. So we can get a solution to this. Um, Uh, our computer whiz is about to switch computers, so I'll call, request a five-minute recess, and then we'll come right back. So, a mover and a seconder for a five-minute recess. Thank you, Councillor Turner, Councillor Osanek. All those in favor? Five minutes. Thank you. So, I'll call the meeting to order again, and... None of that time came off your five your time, <laughs> yes. so thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, I've probably used two of my five minutes, so uh, thank you for the fixing this. So picking up where I left off, I, I was just speaking to the required planning applications, just diving in a little closer to the site. This is kind of showing you what we're trying to do, which is a logistics terminal which is uh, basically a modern, the way I describe it in plain language is it's a modern warehouse facility where trucks come and go to the site and there's actually very little storage of product on site. It literally goes from one truck onto another, leaves the site and carries on. The other reason we need a, the amendment, the official plan amendment is because we're proposing an engineered water solution. This is an area that is not serviced by uh, municipal uh, water or sewer, uh, but it's also a use that doesn't have a high demand uh, for water, and it's an industrial area with a lot of risk for contamination, uh, so we are proposing a uh, engineered water solution, essentially a tank solution that would deal with uh, water to service the property for, you know, kitchen bathrooms, and uh, also if the need be for fire. And we would also propose to prevent residential use from the site uh, as a result of our water solution. So the, you can see that the building itself, when you look at the area, the building itself is quite small. It's only about uh, 15,000 square feet. And uh, the majority of the site, even in terms of the 15 acres uh, of this development, uh, would remain in a natural state. This is also just kind of an, a good slide to kind of just get an idea of where some of those sensitive uses are close by. I had noted there are uh, the Italian Club and two homes on Italia Lane. They're like 600 to 800 meters away. And there's also a couple of houses um, just off this image to the west that are about 600 meters away. And then further houses on McAdoo's Lane on the east side that are about close to a kilometer away. So in terms of the official plan, it's located outside the urban boundary, and you can see how it's partially designated as rural industrial and partially uh, rural. And I would suggest to you that changing the site to rural industrial is a compatible use for this area. And 
you know, just speaking again to the, the reason for the designation is one, to bring it into a rural industrial designation to allow the use, and then the site-specific policy to deal with the water solution and the prohibition of residential use. In terms of the zoning bylaw, this image in the center gives you an idea of the zoning for the area. You can see a combination of open space and industrial designations that kind of surround the area. There are a few A1 designations that have either are vacant or have houses on them. And generally speaking, an A1 designation allows for residential uh, use. And, and even in the industrial case, allows for an accessory dwelling. So we're actually proposing a stricter uh, zone for the property that would not allow residential use. And so that would be the resulting official plan amendment bringing the site into the rural uh, industrial designation. And it would also become a special policy area because of the water policy. So in terms of the zoning bylaw, just zooming in a little closer, you can see the change from the restricted agriculture to a general industrial zone. Uh, again, with the special provision because that industrial zone actually allows for accessory uh, residential because generally speaking, uh, you know, a rural industrial business might be like a welding shop on the back of a person's house. So not necessarily wrong to have residential uses, but in the case of what we're proposing, uh, residential uses would not be appropriate with this use. Uh, we have received comments from uh, one of the neighbors on Italia Lane, specifically related to uh, noise from trucks, uh, backup beepers, as well as heavy traffic on McAdoo's Lane. And um, we have reached out to these neighbors as there are certain measures that we believe we can uh, implement uh, to assist with their concerns. So one of those concerns related to the backup beepers. And so what we have arranged, at least at this point in time with one of those landowners, is to uh, basically measure the noise on the backup beepers in particular uh, on their property. Uh, the noise uh, report is required as part of the site plan control process, uh, but it's a process that we're going to initiate immediately to uh, get those answers. The heavy truck traffic I, I believe is an issue you'll hear about from those residents tonight. Certainly that's a challenging one for us to deal with, um, given the other users on the property. What, what I can say from speaking uh, with my client is that the orientation of McAdoo's Lane at Montreal Street is like an acute angle. So the, the approach angle is not ideal for trucks. So that's not to say that no trucks from our proposal would come down from that highway exit to uh, McAdoo's Lane. However, the Perth Road side, the division side, is a much better uh, access for trucks. It's also closer to our site, and it, it is actually our intent that the majority of our access uh, would be from that highway uh, exit instead. So to conclude, I believe the application is consistent with the provincial policy statement. And even though an amendment is necessary to the official plan, it is consistent with the broad direction of the OP. And ultimately, the zoning bylaw would recognize the special provisions necessary to permit this development. And I am pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. And looking to planning staff for comments. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you, uh, public notice for this application and public meeting was provided in accordance with the Planning Act, which included mailing notice to 25 properties within 125 or within 120 meters of the subject site, as well as signage being posted on the property 20 days in advance of this meeting. In regards to correspondence, uh, staff have received one letter of correspondence to date, um, which is included as Schedule A on tonight's agenda, and um, additional correspondence in the form of a petition was just provided to the committee clerk this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, looking to the committee for comments or questions. Yes, Councillor Sanic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, uh, learning that there was just a petition presented tonight, can we hear what the petition says? Or do we have to wait till we're in under other business? I'm looking to the clerk. We don't typically, do we accept a submission of petitions during 
this meeting. So I can explain. Uh, with the petition, I've accepted it on behalf in my role within the city clerk's department. It will be forwarded on through the typical channels and then through council, through the appropriate department as well. But uh, if you'd like, Councillor Osanek, I can share this with you and you can take a look at it um, this evening at some point. Thank you. And anybody can, uh, in the regular, as I understand it, in the regular section of this committee or at council, uh, you can present uh, you can present that petition if you so desire. So, is that accurate? It's not typical that petitions are presented here, but I do also know that the uh, resident who provided the petition will likely be speaking as part of the public meeting, so can probably make most great. of the content of the pet petition known to the committee at that time. That's great. Thank you very much. Further questions? To Mr. Keenum, um, yeah, thanks very much for clarifying how many of the acres were developed because when I read it, it seemed like all of it was going to. So now I know it's just those 15 acres in green out of the entire 90. And um, with that letter that we got with those suggestions um, through I, to staff, that those, um, if it's possible or not from the letter, that would be addressed in the comprehensive report, each, each point that's made in the letter. Yes, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that, that's right. We would be addressing those comments in the, in the comprehensive report. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? Um, just, I'm curious about what the anticipated hours of operation, because I know uh, we're much more tolerant of noise at... Uh, at six at night than we are at six in the morning. Uh, what do you perceive hours of operation to be? And would, and it, this might be a staff question, would the noise bylaw apply to this property? I'm happy to start, Mr. Chair, and then I'll let staff respond on the, the noise bylaw. And uh, so, so certainly uh, an operation like this is a 24 seven operation. Trucks are on the 401 all the time. Uh, now, however, they are much less uh, on the road, you know, in the evening and nighttime in terms of transition. But it's certainly our intent that it would be a, a 24 seven operation. Um, and I think, you know, I think some of the, some of the items that are going to come out during our, our noise study are going to dictate, you know, what kind of mitigation measures are necessary with that understanding of the operations. And I think just quickly, I think we will be subject to the noise bylaw, so I look forward to hearing staff's response as well. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. The noise bylaw would apply to this. Um, I don't know the specific terms and conditions or the provisions within the bylaw specifically that would be applicable, but we can clarify that coming forward in the comprehensive report. As Mr. Keene indicated, there is a noise study that was required as a component of this. It would also be subject to site plan control going forward for development, at which time any mitigation measures that are required through the noise study that are Im implemented through the zoning would also be implemented through the site plan process. Thank you. And final question. Um, you mentioned that there'll be some mitigating of effects if trucks come off of Division rather than off Montreal Street. Is there any way that that can become normalized for uh, the people access, the trucks accessing this property? Uh, I, I think, you know, I think it's, it's, this is one of those things that's a very hard balancing act because obviously the highway has assigned this as one of these detour routes. It's a route that trucks are capable of using. But I think, you know, I think it, it's one of those things where the Division Street exit is a nicer slope. Like it, it works for trucks that have trailers to make that exit. Whereas, I don't know if I have an image that might show it. It's just cut off. The, the challenge on Montreal Street from a large truck perspective is the fact that, that it's not at a 90 degree. So the trucks actually have, for, trucks have to cut back on themselves to make the Montreal Street exit. 
So that's why many of the smaller trucks that operate in this area, garbage trucks and dump trucks, they don't have the larger uh, box. So they're able to make that turn much easier. But it's, it's our intent to use the other side. And I think, you know, recognizing the interest, you know, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna exclude the fact that there are two residents on the west side as well here. Is, that are right at Victory Lane by the little car dealership. So, you know, I want to be very conscious that there are folks that live right there as well. But certainly the folks that we've discussed about the truck issues that already exist on that road are folks that live on Italia Lane and generally are on the east side of the property. Thank you. Uh, so we will... Turn to the public, anybody who wishes to speak. Um, there's a microphone right here for this side of the room. If you, uh, and just identify name and address. And there's a microphone on the other side of the room as well. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members of the planning committee, my name is Brenda Hamilton. My husband and I live at 1110 Italia Lane. As mentioned in our submission, uh, we own two residential properties on Italia Lane, which covers approximately 22 acres. Our property extends to the gates of the Italo Canadian Club and is immediately south of the properties fronting on Italia McAdoo's Lane. With regard to the current application, our first concern is the potential noise from the trucks and the backup beepers. We recently had a problem with another property, which was quickly resolved. However, we want to stop any future problems before they occur. Mr. McCutcheon from Atulan Transport, con Transport contacted us yesterday, and we we're very thankful that he did. He indicated that he was aware that some backup beepers can be annoying. Uh, the noise bylaw also is from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. in that area. The second concern is the heavy truck traffic on McAdoo's Lane. I've spoken with other residential property owners who access McAdoo's Lane on a daily basis, and each owner was in agreement that something needs to be done to reduce the heavy traffic on the eastern end of McAdoo's Lane. McAdoo's Lane is classified as a local road and does not currently have any heavy truck traffic restrictions, either under normal or seasonal conditions. This road has the same classification as the roads in Cattle Creek Woods subdivision. Under the classification of local road, is supposed to be able to handle up to 1,000 vehicles a day. However, the majority of the vehicles traveling McAdoo's Lane are heavy trucks, with some hauling even heavier equipment on tandem trailers. The proposed logistics depot will create additional heavy truck traffic of 20 to 80 trucks per day for an already busy road, and the road will have to be upgraded to meet this additional traffic. Due to the number of accidents on the 401, McAdoo's Lane has become more active with transport trucks and other vehicles whenever the 401 is closed. There are also many heavy vehicles traveling this road to dispose of material from the 401 road construction. Many passenger vehicles also appear to use this route as a means to avoid the 401 construction and to travel to Kingston Mills Road to access Highway 15. Living on Italia Lane means we have to access the eastern portion of McAdoo's Lane on a daily basis. Due to the heavy truck traffic on McAdoo's Lane, we do not travel on other portions of the road because there are many potholes, mud, dust, and other debris from the truck traffic. These heavy trucks are definitely traveling at higher speeds than the posted speed of 70 kilometers. It is a hazard to try to exit Italia Lane due to the poor visibility of oncoming trucks, plus trying to avoid the stones that spray from their tires when they travel down the road. My understanding from the residential property owners of McAdoo's Lane is that it is just as difficult for them to exit their driveways, if not more so. Their drivers are very close to the travel portion of the road, so the gravel, et cetera, from the heavy trucks creates a definite hazard to any cars parked in their driveways. The majority of the heavy truck traffic along McAdoo's Lane comes from businesses at the western end of McAdoo's Lane. McAdoo's Lane is accessible from both Perth Road, which is Outer Division Street, and also Battersea Road, which is Outer Montreal Street. However, the majority of these heavy trucks travel the complete length of McAdoo's Lane to access the 401 or other portions of the city. It is suggested that in order to alleviate the noise, dust, mud, future potholes, and any other debris caused by the heavy trucks in this residential section of the road, that all heavy truck traffic be required to use the Perth Road entrance to both enter and exit McAdoo's Lane. 
This would create a heavy truck restriction on the eastern portion, which is the residential portion of McAdoo's Lane. This should not create any additional travel time for any heavy vehicles as they can all easily access the 401 and other sections of the city from Division Street. There are signal lights and turning lanes at the Perth Road entrance, which makes it much safer for heavy trucks to enter onto and exit from McAdoo's Lane. The Battersea Road intersection only has a stop sign with a flashing light. If this heavy vehicle restriction were to be put in place, it would have to be waived in the event of emergency situations that McAdoo's Lane is de designated as an emergency detour route. Also, an exemption would have to be provided to allow regular service delivery vehicles to access the residences on this road. So we are requesting that the eastern portion of McAdoo's Lane from Italia Lane to where McAdoo's Lane meets Battersea Road be designated as accessible to only passenger vehicles with the two exemptions I just mentioned. We are requesting this restric restriction regardless of whether the conceptual plan is approved or not. I have provided a petition to the committee clerk and it's been signed by 100% of the residential landowners who either live on or have access to McAdoo's Lane on a daily basis. I also attach photos to the petition that my husband took yesterday of two large trucks trying to maneuver the turn at the same time onto and from Battersea Road. It is important to note that Mr. McCutcheon from Manitoulin Transport indicated in our conversation yesterday that many of the trucks using the depot will not be able to make the turn on Battersea Road anyway, so a requirement for all trucks to use the Perth Road entrance to enter and exit McAdoo's Lane would not be a deal breaker for them. Uh, you'll note on page five of my submission, there was a typo. I get uh, the names Perth Road and Battersea Road mixed up, so it should say we are requesting from Italian Lane to where McAdoo's Lane meets Battersea Road, and it says Perth Road in there. So I thank you for your understanding and assistance in this matter. Thank you. Uh, any further public questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the report. I'm going to keep my points to ones that were not raised so far. Um, I'm supportive in principle of the project. Um, I'm in favor of business development. Um, and I don't live nearby. I don't have the local knowledge that uh, the residents uh, would have for the, these matters. But so it's my first point, a fairly minor one. Um, since you're going to sever this, are you going to obtain a separate street address designation? That's probably a fairly routine thing. Um, just wondering if you could show the the actual proximity. Um, mainly to the western um, access, which is off Perth Road and Division. Um, you've got it in the top of page 40. It's a very small scale. And it's just sort of hard to estimate what that is. Since you referred to it in your presentation, right? You said that that's going to be where the trucks are going to ac exit and uh, enter. Okay. Um, with respect to the resident's petition, I would like to know what's in that and um, would request that it be read out at some point in the meeting. Um, my next point is, um, I'm wondering if we have any similar facilities to this, either in Kingston or in the area, possibly Belleville or Brockville, which are both um, so within an hour, uh, also on the 401, a uh, lot of industrial use, that we might be able to learn from, um, sort of as uh, a comparison. Okay, now some of the debate and questions so far, uh, from the chair especially, I'm just trying to picture what's gonna happen on the site if uh, the, the project is approved, and you're looking to have basically new drivers come in, right, to take over. So are you going to have any actual facilities there on, on site for them? You're going to have a 24-7 operation, as you explained. 
Are you going to have a coffee shop or a lounge or anything like that available? Because I know if I were a driver, I would want to maybe have somewhere, you know, an hour before to prepare for my shift, get a meal or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and maybe even having, a, a, you know, a, a chance for a nap. So just looking at the, the, the level of um, sort of workplace, um, um, I guess, being, you know, being uh, welcome and being compatible for the workers. Um, thank you to the um, resident who uh, made a very thorough presentation earlier. I learned a lot from that. And what I'm wondering about is her concern was over the uh, traffic levels on McAdoo's Lane. So I'm wondering if the city has done any sort of traffic studies on that. She seems to indicate that the traffic levels are quite high when it comes to transport use. And then going along that, uh, with that would be uh, the actual condition of the road. seconds. Okay. Um, wondering if maybe the eastern uh, access to, to um, Montreal Street, Battersea could be signalized. And if you're going to have anything in the way of only one way access, are you going to enforce that? So I think that's basically uh, all I have to say. And if the clerk wishes, I can write those points up and then send them in independently so they're on the record. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? We'll turn to our staff and to the planner. And I just want to point out, as I'm sure everybody's aware, uh, we are only speaking to land use questions tonight. So questions regarding where there may be where you may have competitors along the 401 isn't really relevant to what the work at hand. So, thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, to Ms. Hamilton and Mr. Dixon for the questions. You've noticed someone's joined me at the podium. This is Terry McCutcheon uh, from Manitoulin Transport, and he's gonna assist with some of the questions. So I'll hit on some of the questions and then I'll let Terry fill in the gaps and, uh, and help with some of the logistics about the operation in terms of some of the questions that Mr. Dixon asked. So I think, I think first and foremost, we're very grateful to receive the comments from Ms. Hamilton and the petition because it helps us to understand you know, the, the, that there are residential uses in that area and uh, we're very willing to work with them uh, to, to find solutions, work with them to deal with noise and assess like the real impacts here. Um, and and we're, we're quite confident that because of the distance with these users that we will find uh, solutions to this matter. And you know, I think you'll, you'll hear from Mr. McCutcheon that the primary access that we intend to use is Division Street. Uh, division, the McAdoo's Lane is approximately two kilometers long. That's kind of the, uh, you know, if you think of exit numbers 617 to 619 on the 401, those numbers represent kilometers. So McAdoo's Lane is approximately two kilometers long, and our site is approximately 600 meters or slightly more than a half a kilometer from Perth Road. So it's closer to Perth Road. So ultimately, so right now this is, uh, we had actually attempted to do the consent application first ahead of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment and site plan control, but because we are proposing a unique water solution, we had to, we have to do an official plan amendment first. So otherwise, the, so any signage you would have seen showed that the whole 90 acre property as raised by Councillor Osanic but the application is only for this western piece. Um, so ultimately, it would get its own street address. Uh, it could be 1201. That'll depend on uh, what the planning department determines. And I think, um, I think there are a few that staff might want to respond to, but I think I'll turn it to you, Terry, to respond to maybe some of the logistics and if you want to come up or you can hit the button. Mr. Chair, uh, through you to the member of the public asking the questions about the details of our operations of a truck terminal. Um, just and trying to keep it brief, uh, we have two essential functions of a truck terminal and that's basically to, to take goods, any kinds of goods, all kinds of goods basically, 
Um, old, the old saying is, if, if you bought it, a truck brought it. Um, from local, pick up some deliveries. And local could be in Kingston, could be as far away as Napanee or uh, other communities in the area. Bring those goods to the terminal. Those goods are then transferred from the local pickup and delivery vehicles onto trucks, which we call highway units, and are further taken, taken to further points in the country and uh, even in the United States and other points in North America and sometimes in the world. Uh, so we have two, uh, two essential operations. The local pickup and delivery operation, where we have local drivers based in the Kingston area that show up to work at the same time every day, go out, pick up the products that they're picking up in the Kingston area. Okay. Um, bring them back to the terminal, put them on highway trucks, take them away. Similarly, the highway trucks bring products to the Kingston area. They're transferred from those trucks into the local pickup and delivery units at, at the terminal, essentially crossing the dock, which we call these, this facility a cross dock, onto the local, local units for delivery to the, to the local area. Uh, there are probably, in this particular case, five or six support staff, admin people, people, dock workers who work full time in the building. There'll probably be 10 to 15 local drivers that, that drive and deliver and pick up, make pickups in the local area. And there'll be any number of highway drivers arriving from the east and from the west, and probably also from the Ottawa area, uh, doing highway deliveries and, and, uh, and taking freight away from the terminal uh, at this location. There will be facilities in the building for uh, 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 lunch facilities and that sort of thing. This won't be a primary hub though because of its proximity to both Montreal and Toronto. So the highway drivers won't likely be taking rest stops here at this facility. So there won't be, there won't be showering facilities or if there are, there'll just be for the, lo for the uh, local people. Uh, there won't be a, a place to uh, take a rest or a nap at this, at this particular facility. We do have them at other facilities. Thank you. Uh, so, staff, are there any comments you'd like to add? Thank yes. you, through you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess one, th one thing to add, um, our engineering division has um, asked for preliminary traffic information that is going to be um, submitted as part of this application. Um, and so the purpose of that is um, to determine um, and really look into the proposed routes for accessing onto the 401 traffic volumes um, and traffic times um, to better inform um, our engineering division as well what, what upgrades would potentially need to be required um, and whether they would be um, feasible as well. Um, and then as part of site plan control, again, there's going to be more detailed traffic impact information. Um, and then this again being, um, at least the preliminary traffic information we'll be addressing in the comprehensive report too and fitting that in with comments submitted by the, um, the residents. Thank you. Um, any further questions or comments from the committee? Uh, I'm afraid the public uh, portion is closed now, but you're welcome to, in writing, request, send any questions or comments, and those will be uh, recognized as official uh, correspondence. Uh, so that, that's what I would encourage you to do, if you would. Um, I know I'm a bit of a process wonk, so I'm going to ask a couple of procedural questions. When the comprehensive report with whatever recommendations comes forward, will there be an opportunity for a non-statutory public meeting as we're now trying to do with, with some of those uh, comprehensive reports? Do you anticipate that giving the public a second opportunity to comment? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Yes, I wouldn't consider it to be a non-statutory public meeting necessarily because notice won't be provided in the same format. However, we will be advancing the opportunity for the public to start speaking to comprehensive reports at planning committee. Um, it was to start this evening. However, we don't have any comprehensive reports on the agenda tonight. Thank you. So I'm presuming that we would be able to contact those whose names appear either in delegation or in 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 uh, any letters that have been sent. 
Through you, Mr. Chair, if anybody has signed up as an interested party or provided correspondence as has happened this evening, they will definitely be provided notice of the comprehensive report or any meetings going forward. Great, thank you. And my further question, so don't turn your mic off too soon. Uh, my further question is, do you anticipate the comprehensive report to include site plan recommendations? Uh, I see you looking to the to proponents for that. And the reason, the reason I ask that is just to let the public know that site plan, and correct anything that I may misspeak here, but site plan is a delegated authority to staff. So most frequently, site plan is negotiated between our staff and the proponents. There is a process called bump up, which allows a counselor, usually a district counselor, to take to council a request to bump up site plan. And what that means is that it comes to planning, the report is made public, uh, the site plan report, and the public have an opportunity through members of the committee to ask questions if there are further questions. So is that relatively accurate? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, that's relatively accurate. At this point, we don't have an application for site plan control. However, we can work with the applicant to have a more detailed concept plan at a minimum in terms of bringing a recommendation forward. Um, in the absence of that, given the studies that are being done and some of the other details that we will be looking at in arriving at a comprehensive report, and it looks like Mr. Keene might have something to add to that because he's standing up, um, we can make sure that we itemize some of the details in the comprehensive report that relate to the site plan control process. That would be helpful. Yes, Mr. Keene. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to add that, you know, typically we wait until after the public meeting to initiate our site plan application because this is our opportunity to hear from the public, learn how our applications might be tweaked. But I can, what I can tell this room, tell the neighbors, tell this committee is we're starting to gear up for our site plan application. And because planning is an upfront process, it's to our benefit to initiate the site plan before this committee uh, hopefully has a recommendation for approval. So there will be what I would call refining details to the site plan, the current conceptual plan that we have that will be available for public viewing. They will have our noise, comments, so the inf you'll have that information so that you'll, you're able to make an educated decision on this. Great, and for members of the public, site plan deals with uh, parking, with, uh, with landscaping, with fencing, and those all likely will have some impact on some of the questions you've raised tonight, so. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, I declare this meeting closed. Uh, and we'll move on to our third and final public meeting, which is held pursuant to the Planning Act, a zoning bylaw amendment, and it's for 2666 Princess Street and 1027 Midland Avenue. You're doing double duty tonight. So, you're on. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I should have mentioned the pet re request for the petition. Your district councillor, uh, Mr. Osanek, had, oh, Mr. Osanek, sorry, Mr. Oosteroff has said, <laughs> sorry about that, uh, has said that he would present that at our next council meeting. So that will become part of the public record. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, good evening again. And uh, this, this is an application for a zoning bylaw amendment uh, on Midland Avenue and Princess Street. And I want to take the opportunity to introduce you to Brad Chase. And Brad is from IBI Group and is the lead architect on this project. And uh, will be assisting me with any uh, questions this evening. 
and extra information. So what, what we have tonight is a, uh, an application right really on the western hub, the other hub of Princess Street, you could say, by the mall. And it is near the corner of Princess and Midland, close, it's really at the edge of the uh, corridor, the Princess Street corridor, the Cat Town Center, uh, bus routes, park, schools, the library is there. And it's a transition area between a commercial and residential uh, uses, which I will, uh, which I'll show you in a moment on a, on an official plan image. So the site is mostly vacant uh, right now. This is this site surrounds the McDonald's, and at the moment there is still a single detached dwelling on Midland Avenue. It's basically uh, boarded up. And this is, this is kind of a bit of an edge property. Princess Street has commercial uses, mixing with some residential uses, and you can see the residential uses to the north of the site. And you can see how our subject site, the red line, actually cuts through the McDonald's parking lot because McDonald's has an easement uh, over this property uh, that allows them access as well as some additional parking. So the application that's before the committee tonight is a zoning bylaw amendment to allow a senior supportive living facility or a senior's home. And the proposal is a uh, three and a six story building that, that is going to be approximately 170 units offering both independent living and care units. And it offers parking both at grade as well as covered spaces within the first floor of the building. There's vast amounts of community indoor amenity, outdoor amenity, rooftop amenity, a very small piece that I'll show you. And the site would have access to both Princess and Midland Avenue. There's currently a holding provision on the site uh, that would be lifted as part of this application. We've actually never been able to determine why it's there, but we think it might have been a servicing issue. Uh, so our application would remove that through the studies that we've done. So zooming in now on the actual concept plan, you can see how our site wraps around the McDonald's again. And what's being proposed is the, the three-story wings, which are the care wings, are abutting uh, the residential area. And the taller portion of the building comes toward the front of the property at Princess Street. This is just to kind of help just visualize uh, how we see at least some preliminary landscaping for the site. So there is a existing pathway on the western boundary of the property that, we, uh, that will be maintained uh, and that we're going to further enhance by landscaping it. On the north side of the property where the three-story building abuts the backyards of the residential neighbors, there's a stormwater management facility that already exists there for the residential neighbors. So we're going to put a pathway uh, close to the building and then we're going to enhance the, uh, basically the stormwater feature uh, with landscaping, a uh, lot more trees um, to really dress that up. That area is kind of like, it, it's private, but at the same time, it's like semi-public because of the way that it, it accesses out to Midland Avenue. So that is something that, you know, would be available for people coming either down through to Princess Street or to the east out to Midland Avenue. And you can see there's a nice gazebo on the far east side of the property. And this just kind of shows how our site works as well uh, with McDonald's and their existing operations. So in looking at the uh, ground floor plan, let me just uh, turn over my pages here. The ground floor doesn't contain any residential units. So it's primarily made up of indoor parking at both ends that would serve as tenants and staff, but it also contains the, it primarily contains the amenity areas. A bistro, a pool, a library, a chapel, a media room, fitness lockers, and a lobby. As we start to move up the building, this, this floor, which I'm showing you is the third floor, is really close to the second floor and it contains uh, residential units and a few shared amenity spaces as well. And you can see how the northern wing is the, the, care, the care wings, whereas the independent living 
is on the southern wing that fronts up towards Princess Street. Now, as I move to the fourth floor, you can see that the care wing stop because that is, that is the roof of the third floor. And there is a small, and it's enclosed, it's outdoor, it's a rooftop amenity area, but at the same time, it's enclosed behind the roof. Uh, so it's a, a nice closed outdoor amenity space on that uh, roof of the third floor. And you can see the independent living apartments uh, on this floor. Apartments is maybe the wrong word. I'm gonna, these are just some of the elevations. I'm gonna skip to the 3D images because they actually tell the story a little bit easier. In terms of looking at the rendering from, from this angle, you can see the gazebo that's proposed close to Midland Avenue. You know, they're, the renderings kind of show the transition from the third to the third floor and then the sixth floor uh, front portion at Princess Street. And you can see the, you, you can't really see the rooftop amenity, but the rooftop amenity is in, uh, let's see if I can get my mouse to show up. The rooftop amenity is in the, that upper portion of that third floor of the center on the image. So I'm just looking at access from Midland Avenue, you can kind of see the McDonald's is kind of grayed out at the front of the image in terms of what you would look at if you're looking through Midland Avenue and then turning around from the other angle, looking at Pin Princess Street, looking at the front entrance, which is fairly central to the property with, with our, our public parking, tenant parking there at the front of the building as well. And you know, with this being an L-shaped building, the, you can see it's been a challenging site to, to design. We've tried to meet principles of pulling the building close to Princess Street while also keeping our, our heights low as we abut the residential neighbors at the rear. So in terms of the official plan, the top image is really the uh, city structure schedule. So what you can see there in our plan, which is a corridor and nodes plan, you can see the orange circle, which is really at Gardner and Princess, but it kind of extends to Midland Avenue right at the edge. And you can see how from a city structure perspective, we are, we are at this point of being a node, we're a housing district, we're a business district, we're a center and we're a corridor. And then when you look at the lower image, that's showing the land use schedule. And you can see that our site is entirely in an arterial uh, commercial land use designation. And medium and high density residential uses are permitted in the arterial commercial designation when the property abuts other residential land uses. So in this case, an official plan amendment is not necessary because of that abutting residential use and the semi-residential, semi-institutional nature of, of our project uh, conforms to the official plan. So the site is already zoned uh, commercial and um, the zoning bylaw is not up to date with the official plan. So we need an amendment that would allow our senior supportive uh, living facility on this property. So what we're actually seeking is to permit a uh, apartment dwelling because that's the way it's defined in that bylaw and that's the way the city has handled other uh, supportive living situations like this. So overall, the application is uh, consistent with the provincial policy statement. It certainly meets the intent, the strategic direction of the official plan. And it's a, it's a good transitional use with the residential neighbors on this site. And the zoning bylaw amendment would recognize a number of specific provisions to control uh, the development uh, that we are proposing. And there's a future site plan application that would be forthcoming. And I do have, um, some of this very specific zoning uh, amendments if you want to, if you want to uh, speak to any of those specifically. I think the one that I want to bring to your attention, uh, the most important, um, because many members on this committee have seen our use of height maps for, for downtown facilities where we're putting a tall building on a small site. In this case, because of the sheer size of the site and the fact we're really mostly proposing a three-story building, what we've proposed to control height on this site 
is to limit the height to three stories, 12 and a half meters, um, basically close to the residential users. And then the, the six story portion, the 22 story portion would also be limited within um, 26 meters of a residential zone. So that, so basically allowing all seniors care, the owner of the land, a little bit of flexibility as we tweak through the site plan process, but giving those residents the known control factor that we are proposing three stories at the back and we're proposing six stories at the front and there's a line that would control that. So I'm pleased to uh, respond to any questions. Thank you. Turning to staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Staff confirmed that uh, notification of this public meeting this evening has been completed in accordance with the Planning Act. The mail out notification included 67 property owners. To date, staff have not received any written correspondence with respect to the proposed zoning amendment. Uh, staff have fielded a couple of telephone inquiries which provided some positive remarks about the proposed development. Um, those um, Residents also wanted assurances that the, the existing north-south um, pedestrian linkage would be maintained through the development, um, which I think is included on the proposed uh, conceptual site plan and is also required through the criteria for developing an arterial commercial um, designated site with, a, with this type of development. And, and so those were uh, positive telephone calls that were fielded by staff. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Yes, Councillor Osanek. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Yeah, I think the um, site plan or this concept plan looks very thoughtful and I think that's great that the mail out went to 67 homes and only positive comments and um, I'm not sure if anyone is here tonight uh, to speak to it, but um, that seems really promising. I was going to ask about that Western pathway because I know it's been used for many, many years and we get comments um, about it. Like I know this past summer there was wild parsnip there and now all this will be dug out. So that's good to hear for that. Um, will, the, will the pathway be like, would it be able to be mint? Um, is it going to get muddy or is it going to sort of be some sort of paver or asphalt? What's the plan for the pathway? Yes, so through you, Mr. Chair, that it is actually a legal right-of-way that was established when the subdivision was created. So now that, now that we will essentially maintain control over that pathway, I'll just go to my landscape plan. Um, you know, it, it, this project is geared towards seniors, so our intention is to make all the paths hard, concrete, asphalt. So it will be a hard uh, surface uh, all the way to uh, Princess Street. Um, and now, again, with having some control over that easement, it will be nicely landscaped as well. So it should be a significant improvement, but I think most importantly, as uh, the staff planner pointed out, it, it will be maintained. And that's why I bring to your attention it's an easement. That is staying there, uh, and we're going to improve it. Perfect. Thank you. And thanks also for doing a landscape buffer between the back of the building and the homes, because uh, I'm sure that's a point that would have been raised uh, by some residents. So that's great to see, too. And also how you're doing three stories at the back to, again, give protection as a buffer, you know, to the back of the homes. So um, my only question is, I do know that this intersection is really, really busy. <laughs> I'm very familiar with it, right? Because my daughter did Kingston Gymnastics down the street for so many years, so many times a week. So for um, to go, if you're going south on Midland, well, if you're using Midland Avenue, do you expect visitors to the home to go off of Midland or to always use Princess Street? Would it just be service vehicles um, accessing the home from Midland Avenue, or like, can I, can, can, can cars actually go all the way through as visitors and park at the retirement home? Okay, so a couple things here. We've done a traffic report because Midland Avenue has to be upgraded. We're kind of like the last person in the queue that's gonna make some of those Midland Avenue upgrades that are required. So basically when this site starts, the Midland Avenue, exit right now, which you can make left turns on, won't be anymore. It will be a right in, right out only. Um, and so at that point, the that really that area of the parking is going to service um, deliveries, 
staff parking because we have some covered parking at the back of the building. Uh, and of course, it will continue to serve McDonald's. And so the, the primary access for the site for both visitors and residents would be the Princess Street uh, entrance to the site. And then my question with that, just because I don't have it memorized, can you turn left out of there onto Princess Street to head east? Or is that um, median all the way across that far? I, I'm trying to remember, but I... I, I, I didn't drive I, by it tonight. I, I, you know, there is a median there, and I... Yeah, I think we're... I think it's a full movement, right? Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, uh, the architect, Mr. Chase, is reminding me that it is a full movement there. So you could turn, it is open? Yes. Okay, yes. so it's not get, from Princess Street, it won't be right in, right out. out. Right. It is, you could actually turn left. Yes. Hmm. Okay, great. Well, thanks for answering my questions. Thank you. Councillor Oosteroff, then Councillor Turner. Yeah, I, I like it too. I, I think it's a great location for it. I just wondered the uh, the land just to the uh, to the west there. It, are, are we uh, creating a landlocked situation, or is there still potential for uh, for this to be developed? Like, a, wouldn't it make sense to take the whole whole piece right up to uh, Leon's or whatever it is there? But uh, I'm not sure if you can. But my point, it, it would be nice to fill that area up, or is that actually still developable? Is it so? To the, to so the through, west. So through you, Mr. Chair, I can tell you we're developing every inch that our client owns. <laughs> <laughs> so there are, uh, to the west of us, there's kind of like a small business house that operates to the west and then another um, like warehouse type building. So those are separate owners that are not, oh, okay. uh, not part of our, our group. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Turner. Thank you and through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, you were talking about some amenities, so you mentioned there's a pool, and I didn't catch the other things. Let me turn back to my slide, and I think Mr. if I miss some, Mr. Chase will speak up as well. <laughs> I, have them, I have some of these listed here. So the main floor, uh, there's a bistro, so when you're visiting relatives, there's a bistro that would be available. Uh, there's a pool, a library, a chapel, a media room, fitness room, lockers, lobby, and then there's like there's some like rooms on the upper floors where you would have some things like physiotherapy and other other training. Uh, you can see from the screen there's a fair bit of landscaped outdoor space. Uh, the independent living has balconies on the princess side, so not necessarily the care facilities, but the the independent living, and then there's that lovely rooftop terrace that's kind of enclosed by the roof at the back there. I don't know if I missed any. Great, that sounds awesome. Can I sign up? <laughs> and, um, in but 30 years. In 30 years, yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of parking, do you think there'll be enough parking because it's a bit car-centric? I know it says some assisted living, so maybe those residents won't need um, mm -hmm. to park a car, but um, do you think there'll be enough parking facilities for this? Yes, through you, Mr. Chair. So, th you know, this is something that we had much discussion about was, you know, would we, would we have sufficient parking? And um, we're actually meeting, uh, like, the parking requirements for living of, of this nature, which is um, there are over 90 spaces. So in terms of assisted living versus care facility, that's about half of the spaces are... You could say people that are independent and come and go. So we're actually meeting the bylaw requirements generally, which are about half the space per uh, per unit uh, in this case. So I believe I believe we have sufficient space. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. I think it's going to look great. Um, I. I agree with Councillor Sanic. Any time a development looks better when it's done than what it replaced is a good thing, and I appreciate that. I have a couple of environmental issues. Uh, one is um, increasingly there are alternatives to storm water management that are green alternatives. Um, I see you have lots of trees, which is fantastic. 
but will there be some design, either porous, asphalt, swales, rain, rain gardens, other opportunities to mitigate any uh, hard surface uh, water runoff? Well, t well, to you, Mr. Chair, um, certainly the, the sidewalks and the driving surfaces are intended to be uh, paved, but you'll notice how, like across the north side of the property is an easement for stormwater catchment of the residential neighborhood to the north. Um, but our engineers looked at it and we have opportunities to improve that feature so that it will become a bit more of a mixed amenity, you know, look more like a stream and allow it to, you know, draw in that groundwater flow. And some of the things I missed earlier, there's actually gonna be some gardens that the, t that the people will be able to plant themselves uh, that live there. So there's many areas that are grassy or gardened that will be able to take uh, in that, that flow as well. But, but certainly the paved surfaces right now would be interlock concrete uh, and pavement largely dealing with accessibility, but I think, you know, it's certainly it's gonna be a very nice place. So these are, we can look at some of the technologies to see if some might be appropriate. That would be great. And um, could I request some consideration for uh, electric charging for electric cars, either in the staff parking or a couple of uh, spots, because that is definitely the wave of the future. Hit, just hit the button. There you go. Yeah, actually, that's a new code requirement coming in next year. That uh, we do have about, I think, uh, 30 parking spaces under the building or within the building. And the new Ontario Building Code requires 15% of those cars to have electric charging stations. Um, so th they're seeing that future. So it will be incorporated. I appreciate that. That's reassuring. Um, my other question, and I bring this up, and I know it's assisted living, and there's a certain stereotype about the elderly, but uh, will there be some allowance for bike parking for either staff or uh, the ardent senior bike population on site? Okay. Sorry, okay. Um, certainly, we, we haven't provided in, indoor. We can certainly have enough space uh, for outdoor parking, but there might be some opportunities in the covered parking um, for, for bicycles as well, for staff. Certainly, the residents, we haven't seen that demand, but definitely staff, uh, even visitors, I think would be nice to provide that. Yes. Great. I look forward to that. Thank you. So, any uh, questions from the public? Uh, microphones, if anybody wishes to speak. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation and the report. Um, so, I'm supportive in principle um, of the proposal. Um, you're using vacant land, um, excellent infill. Um, you're near arterials and transit. Um, seems to be a very attractive design. And you put a lot of thought into the actual logistics of how it's going to work. So that's all um, really impressive at this stage. It's an introductory um, stage that we're at. Okay, so now starting into my questions. Um, you're speaking about the house that is going to come down as part of the proposal, should it go through. Is this like 1027 Midland in the northeastern section of the property? I'm just wondering if there's anything of interest with that house. Um, you didn't say anything in the report about that, nor in the presentation. So I just want to get that question on the record. Um, it's not a nice design or heritage aspect that we don't know about. So that question out there. Um, now, in the presentation, um, we heard about a, a possible parking structure. And I'm just wondering whereabouts that is on the site, because I was unable to figure that out, either from the slides or the material that's in the agenda package. Um, 
So it would seem that you would want to have it maybe closer to the residence so that you, maybe you can park and then go right in. So that, that's uh, good. Now I'm going to get into uh, a bit more of the critical side on um, what I've seen. Um, looking at page 56 in the package, um, you've got a top left small rendering of what it's going to look like. And then you've got a bunch of data boxes. And if I had an electron microscope, I might be able to read them. It's impossible to read what's there. OK? That's professionally inadequate. I expect better. OK? Same thing could, with could the. Could we kindly keep our comments strictly? to land use issues and policy Well, it's policy around, questions. Uh, with all respect, Mr. Chair, um, if members of the public can't figure out how the land is going to be used based on information, then we if can't you, comment if, on it. If you could kindly formulate that in a specific question that's answerable and not a rhetorical comment, okay. that would be much appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will do so. So my question to the proponents is, why can't the information specific to the planning details be conveyed in a manner where the public can actually read and understand it? OK? And I put that question on the record also with the clerk. So and so my last question is, uh, this fits in with the logistical um, aspect of the site. How many staff members do you expect to be um, working on the site should the project be approved and constructed um, as envisioned? Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions from the public? Seeing none. Uh, I'll turn to the proponent uh, for response, and then we'll go back to staff. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Dixon. So the house on Midland Avenue is a bungalow and is of, of no uh, significant value in terms of heritage. The parking structure is within the first floor. So let me just get to my first floor here. And so you can see on the care wing on the east side, there is some parking represented. And in the southern wing of the first floor, there's also some parking represented. And uh, in terms of staff members, a day shift would have 20 to 30 uh, people working on site. It's a three-shift operation, uh, so the afternoon and evening shifts would be would be slightly less people, um, but you, but you could see that it, a facility like this would certainly employ uh, 60 people and possibly a few more than that. And I'm also happy to address Mr. Dixon's question with respect to uh, readability of reports because because I think what Mr. Dixon's having trouble reading is the information that's in your printed package because none of my reports are 56 pages long, so I don't have a page 56. So what I can suggest is that when you're reviewing our applications, it's public information. We submit our documents digitally, but at the same time in making our documents, we print them at eight and a half by 11 to verify if they're readable. So if you go to the online dash hub and, and go to our application, you can, you can download our reports and view them digitally, and we produce our reports at a very high resolution, which actually allows you to zoom in much more than eight and a half by 11. And then I'm sure Mr. Dixon will be able to uh, view those details. And so that would be true of all applications. I believe the challenge is maybe with the, the package that you have, which is reduced to make it all fit, and, and therefore some of that image quality is lost. But I would like to ensure Mr. Dixon that my images are very high quality and readable. And uh, I would encourage him to read our stuff online. Thank you. Any further comments from staff? 
No? Seeing none, uh, last kick at the can for the committee. Seeing none, I look forward to uh, the report coming forward. Thank, Thank you. you. So, we will move on to, and I'll call the regular meeting to order. Thank you. Uh, the comprehensive report, uh, uh, D140281017, has been withdrawn. And uh, so that recommendation will come forward in whatever altered form in the future. Um, so that brings us down to. Uh, Approval of the agenda with that withdrawal. Moved by Councillor Sanic, seconded by Vice Chair Turner. I've got to get in the habit of saying that. <laughs> so, all those in favor of the agenda? Carried. Uh, confirmation of minutes from our previous meeting. None minute, none here. Disclosure of pecuniary interests. Seeing none. Uh, delegations, none. Briefings, none. Business. A, item A has been removed. Uh, that takes us to motions already. Uh, motions, seeing none. Notices of motion, seeing none. Other business, seeing none. We did receive some correspondence, comments, seeing none. Uh, date of our and time of our next meeting, January 4th. We should all have recovered by then. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Ms. Vendetti. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, I just wanted to note that um, we do not have any applications that we're bringing forward for the meeting on January 4th, so there's no need for a meeting on January So hope 4th. springs eternal. We may have the day off. That's good. I appreciate that. And thank you very much. I will call for a motion to adjourn. Everybody put their hand up. Take your pick. All those in favor, carried. Thank you.